engineer. You're not an are engineer. You? I'm not starting the, guy the that's show the with, with, yeah, with you're not an I know that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dave, are we good? <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm the smartest on the show, <laughs> by the way. I uh, just wanted to open Free Range American up with that. <laughs> yeah. If you wanted, yeah. you know, the Dr. Dr. Steve, Dr. Evan Hafer mm-hmm. over there is, is the smartest. Smartest one on the show. I don't know. I don't. I. I, I doubt that's true. Actually, it could be the smartest. I doubt it. it depends what kind of smarts you know. Yeah. So it, if it, we're doing like, I would imagine my math scores are relatively if, high compared to the. If the you measure skills, like like like, what are the weighted weighted skills? Starts with survivability, security. Does it? Does it start I, with? I would say like you gotta you gotta start pr- primitive right. when you're when you're going okay, you're judging a man based on. On just his pure intellect, pure survival. Knowledge. Yeah, like pure, just survival starts with that. So really primitive. Are you mm. able to make yourself fire? Can you make mm. yourself shelter? And can you find yourself food? Yes. Okay. So All three of those things are check, check, check. And you'd say probably about a high eighties proficiency, eighty percent proficiency at but all three of those things. I think if I was given the right environment. In the right tools. Well, you know how to prepare. The too. right, yeah, That's the right environment, is. the right tools. I think I could absolutely sustain my own survival for an extended period of time. See, I that, have confidence in that. That's where I think intelligence starts. So, mm. but I, the interesting thing is, is I, I couldn't be one of those guys that like steps out into the woods with just a loincloth. No, like that's no, a no, different no, no, no. level of proficiency. No. Eh, I think it's just a matter of time in that environment though. It, well, no, we're well, talking I think about it's even knowledge more than and that. intelligence right now. So step one, it's preparation and planning. You have, you, you possess knowledge about, about what you, what your needs are. So, so you're putting rules to the criteria at well, this point. Is I'm, that what you're well, doing? You're putting, I, I, no, I'm dating it. I'm saying, okay, in 2020, we're measuring a man's, you know, yeah, in, okay. Intellect. Let's, I like to play this game. Let's yeah. go. Let's go with this game. Let's do this. <laughs> let's go. Let's let's. I like to play this game. Come on. Yeah. So, so, so where are you at? <laughs> <laughs> in yeah. the first three categories. Uh, yes. I'd say mid seventy percent. I I I I know if I'm if I have to go out in the in the wilderness and I know a ballpark of how long I need to survive. I know what what I'm going to purchase or what I'm going to plant, what I'm going to prep with. What, what you're going to acquire. I, yes, I know yeah. what I'm going to... I'm, I'm going to start fulfilling the easiest portion. So, okay, first, water. I'm going to make sure I pack myself some sort of filtration. So you're finally going to start drinking water. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, In this I mean, scenario, necessity, <laughs> Jared's going to start drinking water. I'm going to have to pack hardcore liver medication. You're going to have to go day, through detox 14, first while you're out there. Day 21, my liver is <laughs> going to start shutting down due to lack of alcohol and the crystallization of my liver that has taken place up to this point is going to start. You I know, picture Jared being out there. Day five, he looks something like Gollum. Just pouncing on a fish in a shallow stream. <laughs> like, ah, precious. I've just seen. I've seen how comfortable Jared is in the outdoors most of the time. Mm. Like he is very comfortable, but the comfort level doesn't come from competence. It doesn't. It, it comes from a place of repetition and planning. No, because because, uh, and I'll give you why. Because I had to spend a week a month in the field for. Four years of my life Where? Ins- instructing when I was in, an instructor for school. But that was get, in the Air Force. That you, doesn't you're count. You're still going to the field. It, it like you get count. so you get so it's it's uh, right behind every, their barracks. Every trip you're There's doing a field this right once behind their barracks. Month. You're doing an FT a field problem once a month. Every trip you have a lesson to learn or something new that you're gonna modify for the next trip. You know, the first time you go out there. You, you score yourself a cot, and then you're like, wow, a hammock would be way better. So the next time you try the hammock out, okay, that was way better. You're slowly, once you're going that often, you continue to like essentially get comfortable or know how to make yourself comfortable with the least amount of weight that you got to pack in. I've seen you get winded getting into an F-350. So yeah, but there was a that's step not, involved. I know, that's a, what I'm saying. It was a lifted F-350. I've seen, <laughs> there, I've there seen was you. A you know I, stairs are my weakness. Like, <laughs> so, I have a weakness, and stairs is right at the top of the list. Right. So you're rating yourself at a 70% proficiency, survivability S- with proper planning. How long? How are long there, are we going on this? Are there predators and or security issues? Always. Or, always. Always. 
Yeah, but what to what Predators. level? Okay, but we're here, right? So are we here, yeah, Texas? Geez, Texas. that'd be easy. Just walk yeah. down to H E B. <laughs> you don't even need to survive in the wilderness in the of Texas. This is desert. So okay. let's just put it like this. So if we were to do the, we'll call it the the Mexico to America crossing. Mm. So we were to make the walk I've done in the hardest with in the, the <laughs> in the hardest area of Mexico into Texas, the longest walk that illegals make. Yeah, you're looking. Who who would make it to America? Who would make it to America here? Are we talking about the bridge at El Paso? Is it that? No, no, no. I've seen that. That no, you're hard. probably and it's not even it's through Texas. the desert. It's going to be Yuma. You're, I mean, you're you're talking about Gila Bend essentially. I'm not. Is, I just said Texas. I think that's no. yeah. But if the longest portion from a Mexico like decently sure. sized town city to get into the United States, I believe, is down in Gila Bend. And now mm-hmm. we did a we did an exercise with with the seer instructors out there uh, on how to make it through that desert. Mm. So there are, there are in the Arizona landscape, there is a cactus out there that's very abundant that you can drill into and get a good, a good source of water out of. Um, I mean, you have miles upon miles though of just flat. You got to so walk. You got to move at night. So yeah. you shelter in place during the day with, with shade to conserve water right. essentially. And then your movements at night and yeah, you're looking at I think it's somewhere around 180 miles. 180 walking miles. Mm-hmm. Don't forget, you have to convert once you cross the border because it's metric. That's true. So, so it goes from metric to standard. Yep. But I think that where the point of this is is, do you think you could walk 180 miles? And how I long? Know. I don't know. How long is it going? It depends. I mean, just based how long on, it takes. I mean, well, no, I mean, you're going to try. If you extend the time, that means that you have to have more survival Do we skills. have nothing? So you can replace fitness for survival school in this or, or survival skills in this scenario. If you're just a fit guy. No, I like that. I like that. So you, you got to cover 180 miles and you know that's your total distance. How, how are you dividing that up? How many miles are you doing a day to do that in the most? I'm doing 20 way? miles a day. Mm. Okay. Well, you, you got to consider even with a light pack, you can walk 12 miles in three hours. Like so, so just put it. When in was the last time you did that, though? That's not that's not current. Yeah, that was eight years ago. Yeah. And eighty pounds. Yeah. You're carrying a light ru- or a heavy <laughs> rucksack <laughs> yeah. on you yeah, right now. <laughs> 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 and you are going to require at least sixty pounds of water to move. Oh, easily. You're going to drain yeah. easily. This is yeah. this is. I don't. I don't think you make it just out of the water aspect. That's a big gamble. I think you make it. You make it three days without water, you're going to be a fucking wreck. If you don't have any water, you don't have any food, I'd you're crossing yes. as much you, distance as you can. You do 20 miles that first day. That second day, you're going to start slowing down, maybe do 12, 14. That third day, you're really you're going to be a wreck. Shape. You're, you're still not even to the 60-mile mark. You're, that's I literally even, walked halfway. 12 miles yesterday. Huh. Like hunting, I walked 12 miles. So I know that I can walk 12 miles. Fairly easy in a consistent cadence, carrying things, carrying like I carried a rifle yesterday, and it, and I had uh, an RTD with me, so I know that I could carry the, an <laughs> RTD and a rifle. One RTD and Plug. one rifle. Right, Logan's <laughs> been running, so Logan's been running lately. You could probably put in, you'd put in more. You'd probably do thirty miles a night. No, I think thirty is overkill. To be honest with you, you think like, you I don't want to push it too hard, right? Have? Well, I mean, I'm putting the numbers in my head like you're going to be between 45 and 60 pounds of weight like to be self-sustaining. I would say 35. You're going to have to yeah. go on the light end. I'm you're just saying, only yeah, well, gonna, measure, you are we carrying shelter? Like I'm thinking, like, you know, everything's in there. There's tent, there's water, food. Uh, you tent, can't carry that uh, much water. Right? Okay, this is an interesting one. Shelter. What are you going to carry for shelter? Tell tell me. Let's or let's go through our packing list because this is a super interesting one. Shelter, Jared, go. What are you carrying for shelter? I'm just going poncho and, and stakes and, and cord. Okay. Uh, because there is a lot of rock out in that area, and there's a lot of like just right. natural caves and stuff like that that you can get into. Okay. Uh, that was one of the things that when we did the training, like you you do see where where you definitely you shelter military crest, you know, 
twenty percent below the the high ground, so you have visibility and security and shit yeah. like that. So yeah, I'm just going ranger roll. You're going yeah, ranger roll. Are you? So you're just doing poncho liner. What poncho. Time of year is this? You're gonna throw it out on the ground. That's how you're. Yeah, that's does. how. That's how you rock and temperature. Roll. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, you know, I'm assuming it can find a like a three foot stick. Mm-hmm. Make yeah, a you're gonna. Tent, yep. You know. Yep. Five fifty cord. No stakes. Mm-hmm. No. The, all you need is a is that that poncho. Yeah. Get yourself out. Well, of I want sun. a poncho liner because it gets cold in the desert at night, yeah. and I don't like to be chilly. No, lo- hot Logie. Do- he likes to be hot. <laughs> he doesn't like to be cold. He likes Logie to be hot. Logie likes to be hot. Okay, so Tyr, y- you have a pre-existing history from being a-, a Green Beret. Is that correct? That is correct. So he has some subject matter expertise in this. He's been on the show a-, a few times before. So welcome to the show again, Tyr. Thank you. I feel welcome. What are you gonna? What are you carrying? What are you carrying for shelter? Um, probably a rock or something. A rock or something. Yeah, that's only for your MREs that you're eating because it says it on the box. Correct. I, okay. I'm uh, I'm I'm a man of structure and I follow instructions always. Right. Uh, so probably just a, a rock or something. Okay. Or something. A yeah. rock or something. Or something. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm just uh, f- from the travel perspective. I'm basing this off of you know your your basic graduation ruck march for for air school is. 35 pounds of ruck in under three hours. Like, so if you but can you get were 12 in shape. miles, like I'm, I'm just talking about what is your median amount of miles you can accomplish over the night, 12 miles in three hours. Like you can get six hours of, of walking done a night. Like, yeah. Decently. You can do 12 miles in three hours, but time uh, on a road. Yeah. Divide that into hundred eighty. That's also not over land. I mean, and terrain, yeah. you got that. I'm, I'm thinking my hardest ruck marches were in the sand hills sand. of yeah. North Carolina. That had hills that had, and I was 23 when I was put through that nonsense. So I'm not. I'm not thinking it's going to be 12 hours in. in I'm just saying 12 miles 20 miles hours. a night. I don't know. Is achievable? It's achievable. If I don't know. Eight if it's hours of walking. And I agree with Logan. I, I think I'd probably go with the Ranger roll for a shelter. I'd probably get a a good Wooby and. Some kind of poncho ish action. I'm planning on, I would plan on 25 minute miles. I think that's a good sustained walk where I'm not breaking a sweat. Yeah. You know, because I don't, I don't want to sweat because yeah. you're just losing water. I want to be able to walk at a, at a relatively fast pace. I don't want to, you know, be, be running my heart rate at, above 140 150 i just want to keep it at just above 100 25 minute miles up and down the desert so let's just backwards plan it's 25 minute miles and you have 180 miles dave what's the math on that no you have to do the math that's your job dave that's his job 25 <laughs> times 180. I mean, you're, you can just round it up. I think we also have to include there. Mile, at some so point in there, somebody's going to send me an email that I have to answer right then and there. 80 hours. And that's going to be an issue. Huh? That's going to slow me down. 80 hours? 25 times 180. So we just literally lost everybody on the show. So <laughs> that's 75 hours. Yeah, 75 hours. So it's hours. 75 hours is what that comes out to. Of movement. So. Of movement. So if you're walking eight hours, if you're walking eight hours a night, yep. that turns into oh. nine days of walking. Now you have to sustain yourself for nine days with water. So you have nine sort of days food. of walking. Okay. So you have nine days of walking. Yeah, that's doable. Yeah, that's doable. Like nine days is a, is a, is a good... Is a good hump. If you don't have any water, you're going to have to take it or have the means in order to get water. Isn't there, and I don't, I don't do any of you have knowledge on this, but isn't there a movement every year through Holland and Denmark that, that the soldiers did that we recreate, like the U.S. redoes once a year, the army goes out? I'm sure there the, is. It's like this 160-mile movement. You are do you, like 25. talking about the baton? Yeah, yeah, no, baton? not the baton. Because that is it's, the wrong part of the world. No, no, no. no. no there's one that you, you do it over in Europe. You go from a portion in France through Holland. It was, it was a certain... Because the guard unit, the 116th, always goes over and does yeah. this. And they said it's, it's the, 
the most fun, but it's brutal. You're doing 25 miles of movement a day, but that's on roads, obviously. Right. Yeah, you have more daylight. Recreating this march that was mm. done in World War II. I wasn't okay. sure if you guys knew about it or not. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I forget what it's called. I, I can ask somebody at the 116th. So, speaking of which, yeah. wars that we would or would not have liked to fight in. Mm. There's so much. Yeah. Are we keeping yeah. our original MOS in these wars? Or are we or something MOS? close to it? Okay, uh, but I mean, I don't know. Like, like what do you what do you equate a Green Beret to in World War Two or World Jet War II? teams? Yeah. yeah, OSS. That's easy. Yeah. That's where we okay. came from. Yeah, yeah. Um, God, that'd be awesome. Are there's, you kidding me? Yeah, oh, I mean, man. you had like a ninety percent KIA rate. Fuck yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> there's that. But I mean, <laughs> well, I mean, it. imagine this. Like, like. It, Imagine you're you're on D Day. You're an army guy that's being put into one of the one of the landing boats, and you're in front, and you're one of the first boats. You're like, oh man, we are just the bodies to fall until there's too many bodies, and they start running out of ammo. Like, you're not really getting a fighting chance. Those first waves are just to. Here's what I like about the Jedberg thing. Then this is this is the. I mean. Minus the mortality. To, right? to some background, to those of you who don't know what a Jedburg team was in World War II, they were a combined service element that would typically have a, an airborne drop into uh, occupied uh, France, we'll call it, from the German army. So you'd have a French speaker, you'd have uh, a, a British person, an American. They'd combine to make these teams, and what they would do is they would they would disrupt behind the lines. So they would, they would buy with and through, they would stand up guerrilla forces, and then they would typically work with the French resistance, depending on, on where they were. A lot of Jedburgh teams actually went into Italy and a few other places. Mm -hmm. They're also in Africa. But <clears throat> if we just think about the, kind of the, the and standard and image of the Jedburgh team, it's you're working by with and through French resistance forces to disrupt the German army. And they were, depending on the person and the historian, they would debate whether or not they were successful at um, accomplishing their mission as far as being able to disrupt the German army. There's a lot of people that say yes, because uh, they were able to divert German resources in big ways to, to, to solve problems when it specifically when it came to infrastructure where they're blowing up rail lines and things like that <clears throat> but the jedberg team is super super sexy to think about because you know you're out there in occupied france you're it, the crazy thing is which i just found out recently not to digress even further than i have already but i just found out that some of the jedberg teams they were required to wear their uniforms I didn't know this either. That face is what I wanted. To, I wanted. I wanted to see that face. This is like the army has not changed. By no, the way, no, not at all. They I mean, had big... commanders when they jumped into German occupied territory, telling their men they were going to wear their uniforms. This. Yes, wow. doesn't change. American. So it's just always been this way. It's always been. You've had commanders that are that have the IQ of this fucking door hinge running men going, well, that brings yes. Me up, so that brings me, brings me a, a, a good question that I want to ask both of you, because I, I've wondered this too. You know, every, every fight we've been in since, since the Revolutionary War has changed drastically. We have to relearn, you know, how, what our enemy is, how we're going to fight it and things like that. So evolution and Gen evolution. Yeah, gen yeah, yeah, generally taking... A you know guy that that commanded Vietnam put him in the, the front row seat of, of a general position in in you know Gulf One you know they can take some things they learn but is it the same no so you there's a lot of guesswork even with smart in individuals they're fucking guessing based on intel I don't think it's based guesswork on, I think it's ego well yes there's yeah. ego <laughs> and it's okay you take a general a a, a, a an army general for yeah. example that has been the through best. war war college. You know, that studied, you know, all Napoleon and everybody. Okay, this battle, this this happened, right. this battle, this happened. So you have knowledge of previous These guys battles. guys are all but the again, best leaders. But look at, look at like something like Vietnam where we were sending companies of men to attack a hill. Right. Just a hill in the middle of the forest. Like 
yes, it, it ha- it, like some of these hills played a supply chain to the Ho Chi Minh Trail and stuff like this, but what would... What would the what difference would have it made if if a decision more of hey why don't we just push the lines up to the base of the hill set up an artillery position and we'll just hold these these people on the hill as long as we want like keeping them in their holes they're not moving so why are we sending up hundreds of men to fight for a hill that when we take did we really get any advantage? There's the Westmoreland doctrine, uh, you know the there was a. Re- reportable metrics. Yeah. And if we didn't have that metric of body count, were we actually making a dent? Were we making a difference? Mm-hmm. Which is completely contrary to the concept of unconventional warfare. Yeah. It's, uh, is, it, is it built on, is it Westmoreland and McNamara principle of essentially you are going to kill your way into victory through purely the numbers? Not necessarily McNamara is one of the guys strategic pieces though you're it, just trying to stack it, just a, a process of elimination so mcnamara was actually one of the guys that had conducted the analysis with the air force on how many people we had to kill in japanese occupied territory in the, in the pacific in order to win the war in order to tip the tide and that that actually led to the campaign and the strategy of burning the cities to the ground so we we're firebombing cities we were concussing them first, then concussing, them. then then burning Creating them. A firestorm because not because uh, you know fire was a more effective psychological means in order to defeat the enemy. It was a more effective means in order to kill people at a large scale level, in order to get the numbers they needed, in order to tip the the tide against the Japanese. Because this is you're before the atomic the bomb. Wound like you're 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 inflicting as much pain and despair as you can to the general population. To get the commit, the, it's, the, a, it's a psychological, yeah. and it's also a defeating of military age men through pure numbers, right? Mm-hmm. So it's it's psychologically, and then it's too it's the numbers game. So to Tier's point is a Westmoreland McNamara thought, which was ill conceived because they weren't necessarily taking a look at the overall population and then the support of the population from outside countries, which was like this porous border that went, you know back and forth and the actual number of the population was never taken into direct consideration against how many forces we were using. It was just there. You had a bunch of data heads trying to run a war. It, well, that's just, so that's my, yeah. that's my question to both of you. Do you think that there has been massive mistakes made in these conflicts by just again, ego and guessing? Oh of, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe <laughs> I think that's a question. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so what I mean, war wouldn't you want to be in at all? Like no desire whatsoever. No desire. Interesting. I mean, there's there's a there's a two part. There's a really split piece of me in this, which is, um, you know, I I think that there have been wars that we've been in that were probably less ethical. However, they might have been really fun. So when you look at the <laughs> <laughs> less ethical but really fun, right? Yeah. So that scale of like this is kind of fucked up, but it's also f- kind of fun. You know, th- th- you know, there, there's the justification there that I think a, a, the person has to go through. When I look back on history and I, I take a look at the actual the wars that we fought. And what did we achieve and what we, what we didn't achieve, I think, you know, Vietnam is the perfect example, which is I'm not exactly sure what we achieved, what the actual end state to that war was, what we would declare and define as victory. However, I would have truly loved to have been a SOG guy in Vietnam. So yeah. there's that split piece where oh, you would want to, you want to be in that yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, there, there's. A, I can find every war, and I would find every war, and I would say, "Gosh, I would have loved to have been that." So, to Tears Point, I would have loved to have been a Jedburgh guy in World War II. That that to seems me is more amazing. appealing than Sog in Vietnam. Not me. Like like, like Vietnam, I, like you're Sog triple, in Vietnam. Triple, triple canopy jungle, primitive communications, possible air support if you need it, possible medevac maybe, depending but on the what you're doing. But the soundtrack. Yeah, the soundtrack, it, the yeah. music, man. It was like yeah. Hendrix. Paint and, it black. You know? <laughs> I don't know, but finish what you were t- what you yeah. were saying because about you had said Berg's? you said Jedbergs, but why? And this is purely from a selfish standpoint. Yeah, for what you would or wouldn't want to be in. No, he well, like, wanted. Yeah, okay. 
I love, and this goes a little counter to what you were saying about the uniforms. That's why I made that sideways puppy dog face. I was like, <laughs> what? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I love, what I love about special forces is the autonomy. I love the autonomy both to operate and to make decisions. So we are, and you know this, so I'm speaking to everybody else, but we are responsible for, we get assigned a mission, but we're responsible for doing all the, the planning cell uh, and designing the execution. Um, start to finish. It's, it's our mission. And that, that sets us apart from a lot of uh, other, other soft mm-hmm. branches. Right. I love the autonomy of that. And I, I, I think dropping in behind enemy lines in a small team like that, that is the definition of autonomy. You're, mm-hmm. you're on your own. It's up to you. There's a lot of initiative there. You've got to make link up with the resistance. Right. And you've got to, there's Robin Sage moments in there where you can do your best to influence what the resistance is going to do. At the end of the day, <laughs> they're, the, they're the action force and they're going to do whatever they want. Right. But it's your job to, to try to, to shape that yeah. and be the, the go-between, the LNO between them and the main effort on the other side of the, the water. Um. I think one thing that has really hindered our own special operations is the real time communication to the to the commander yes. in the chair. Yeah. Yep. I remember doing a raid in a daylight raid because our partner force didn't have NVGs. I remember doing a daylight raid, um, Hilo assault into the into the mountains in the in the Kuno province, in the Hindu Kush Mountains, and we were getting SATCOM traffic. 30 seconds after being on the X of why haven't we reported back? Yeah. I'm like, uh, we haven't quite cleared this compound yet. Do you mind just sitting back a minute? <laughs> yeah, just, just fucking <laughs> off for a minute? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's another, that's another point that, in my opinion, I feel like the last two major conflicts we've been in, again, like, we have such risk-averse commanders. Yeah. We're going into conflict with one toe in. Yep. We're not going in full bore saying, hey, here's your guys' mission. You're going in to take out the opposing force, flip the ideology, and do this. Like it's more of, yeah, but we gotta kind of respect their culture. But we gotta, we don't know. Uh, you guys I mean, can't look we, at pornography. We, we fired all the uh, so so yeah. We captured do all the tricking. officers. It's like we're yelling we at a beehive. New, we made some new officers out of some guys <laughs> we found. But you guys need yeah. to salute them. You guys need to respect those guys. Like, hey, didn't we just hey. fucking replace their country? Like, I, replace them? Yeah. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? It's like, here, so, this is the best analogy, which is good. I'm glad you're reminding me of it. It's, we're going to give you a toothpick to defeat a hornet's nest. Yes. Go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Here you that's go. that's yeah. what here it go. is. It's like, start stabbing. I don't care start if you stabbing. Find, start stabbing these start hornets. Stab. Stab. Find another don't tool. You, don't you pick, don't you pick that tool. stuff up. Yeah. Don't you nope. pick that nope. stuff up. Nope. nope. You don't pick that poison up. You can't do that. No, my, Here's a my whole pick. thing in there is... I is, need you to get naked. You're going to go get that. You're going <laughs> to get that. I have an incredible disdain for, you know, specifically that, that ODA uh, team sergeant. <laughs> no, the, the guy that, that uh, ended up killing that Afghan police commander that he walked in while raping the boy. Oh, and then yeah. right. we want to hem this guy up. And right. it's like, how do you rightfully... How do you explain yourself to soldiers at that point that, okay, no, it's not about what's the right and wrong thing to do. It's about what the the small thing, the toothpick that oh, we gave man. you. You're not supposed to drop that toothpick. So one thing the enemy learned well before we did, and we're just now catching on to this, is this thing right here that we're talking into and looking into is the weapon of this century. Yeah. It is the weapon of this century. Whoever controls the message controls the battle space. I can agree with that. So you're Jed Bergs, right? Yeah, and well, originally, I, w- I was going to say Mac V. Sog. Oh, yeah, but I do like. I don't know that I'm on the fence about that. I'm on the fence. Yeah. I do like the uh, terrain, yeah, and the climate of uh, Western Europe a little yeah. more than Southeast Asia, which we have both spent plenty of time mm-hmm. in. Yeah. Um. I think uh, I'm going. If you, if you if I have to you jump have in a uniform, multiple? I mean, this well, is a lot. If I have to jump in a uniform, I might go with the Jedbergs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I really, I really kind of think revolutionary because mm. I would have a lot of fun with that with a small team, with when you're fighting a force that is ingrained in their head how they're supposed to fight. I would love that. 
like now to, if you're are you hold on though fuck with them are, are you, you talking about like going, robert strangers are you going which is back in time to do this yes so you're you're going back in time with the mind that you have now the same mindset to do of, yes yes that changes the game a little bit for mm. me yeah okay but keep going Sorry. i i just i think it would be a lot of to to create camouflage you know to to build a team under washington you know, having explained, hey, I know how this goes, and uh, right. I, I have some sort of expertise. Can I have some men? Right. Like, if I had like, a, if I if I got to bring back like a senior Bravo, so yeah. we could start building and rifling new <laughs> new. I didn't cover as, this musket in the like, Bravo like, course. Like, <laughs> yeah, like we're building weapons now based on our knowledge and 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 expertise that we have based so, and then we're making camouflage and things like that. I think that would be a riot to to start the initial attacks, the ambushing and stuff of the British, because again, it's going to take well mm. around a year before you start breaking them of their traditional tactics. Right. And you can just rake the floor with them. Huh? That's interesting. So you'd still work for Washington. Yeah. You'd work yeah, for Washington. Yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, he was, he would be a child then. He's what? 22. I don't. I can't remember exactly how old. When he I first linked he was, up with Lafayette, I think he was. I don't know. He wasn't in his twenties. He was. Sure. Yeah, I'm positive because he was in his twenties. He was still trying to commission in the British Army. Yeah. Yeah. Would yeah. definitely not want to do would be the Civil War, right? Because yeah. we went through this time in 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 this period where it was like yeah. these. This term got generated, which was gentlemanly warfare. Which to me is two things that should never be next to each other. And so one, you're fighting against your people from your own country. And two, you got to stand in line. Like to me, that is the worst case scenario for. And you're wearing wool. Wool. You're wearing wool. I don't like that. In the South. And you're you're walking 10, 20 miles a day. First aid is awful. You have nothing. You're almost guaranteed to lose a limb. No. No. You you had had mead. (laughs) Mead was your medicine. Like, uh, we're about to cut your leg off. Here, have a sip. It's not only like that. From, from a command and control standpoint, Civil War, your regimental commander may have been the president of a bank. Yeah. 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 yeah that's true. Yeah. And you got to follow this guy. You right? got to follow Yeah. But also, guy. too, you get captured. They all speak your language. Yeah. But, I mean, <laughs> there's plenty of circumstances where the, the, the prisoner detention was just atrocious. Yeah. yeah. It was the worst. They were they were fucking horrible. Was that Sometimes you treat prison your own in South people Carolina worse. on the coast. I don't remember the name of it. That's what I mean. Like yeah. I think it's scarier to be taking, taking pr- taken prisoner by your own people than it is. I mean, there is a level of psychology when everybody's just speaking Vietnamese around. And you have one translator that's giving you, and you don't know what they're saying. But when you can hear, you know, let's just kill him. Hey, let's just, let's just cut his head off. Let's just, you're just like, oh. Man. <laughs> yeah, also, can, can you imagine like a southern confederate version of jared who is in charge of prisoners like yeah that, that's one thing hey, I, I, boss. I, I, <laughs> wouldn't want to I got some ideas <laughs> so you're definitely not in for the civil war right what are you in for though? so i'm gonna i'm gonna split I, I had two answers for this one one is going back to uh the native american times like those guys who were in tribes Right. Uh, and I'm, I'm super intrigued by this. Like I'm reading a bunch of stuff right now on this and uh, to go back and like truly live a warrior lifestyle, like where mm. that is your soul existence. So are like, you talking about like the Indian Wars period? Or are you talking about just being part before of the that? Tribe? So, yeah, like 1500s, 1600s oh, in wow, America. Okay. You're an Apache or a yeah. Comanche. Yeah. Wow. To where you're, you're with your tribe. You do everything with them. There's there's one leader traditionally but but generally you know you have this like peer accountability every, and, every and trust with open like the yeah. women are just there for breathing i like how of that course that's where jt goes. Yeah. What? He, what? i like this is where his mind <laughs> logan's that's talking how they about were doing it. living a warrior life and jt's like yeah and you get to fuck anybody who you, you want yeah. well no that's, that's part of it really that's, really that's true though and that's the way the tribes would function yeah. was yes. that every male would sleep with every female so and that they, they didn't have one, they, they didn't have one together. Yeah. Was well, that was thing. way before that was a thing because Europeans thing. Didn't, oh, didn't get yeah. in no. there yet. No. But you raise every single son, every, every, every boy of the tribe is. is your child because you don't know. Yeah. So you treat them all That's equally. That's pretty badass. So it creates this awesome but commune you within have the tribe. Like Eagle Steinberg. Hey, go you smack know Eagle in his mouth. He's not good at 
basketball and some of the other things that you <laughs> Wait, <laughs> <laughs> I just think it'd be an interesting concept splitting child support with the rest of the tribe. Yeah, yeah, but you don't, yeah. you don't have to. But yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> listen, these are part. These are things. To take <laughs> My number one no no. I, I would not want to be in Vietnam, and I just like the the triple canopy communication equipment plus the priority of your mission. So like, if you're dropped in something that you know, they might have told your unit to go do, and then there's right. no air support. There's no nothing. Yeah. They're just like, oh, no, we wanted those guys to go look out in that jungle. Mm, right. You never know when you're just low on the priority. Sounds very so similar like, to the just, tail end of the Obama administration. Just walking. You're walking right. 10, 20 clicks a day, wet. You know, you've got the jungle, like, life and insects that can kill you. You've got, and then you're hunting guys that are from this region, that know it better than you like it's a disaster like I, I i think once you got used to it though there are a lot of guys that really enjoyed it a triple canopy tr- patrol a lot of guys like really nightmare. enjoyed it you have no nvgs like you've starlight scope <laughs> yeah. yeah see I, yeah. see i'm, I'm with You're these like guys parachute flares and shit <laughs> that was my other conflict like and it may be because i was absolutely obsessed with snipers in vietnam but like that, that's where yeah. yeah that's the one thing man like i think about that like that's where like the amount of concealment you have how valuable is a sniper yeah. within that conflict right. and then the the ability to operate you know in well, traditional one to two man elements and go out on bad. your own that's our fault like we yeah, saw no. how good of an asset that that did for us in the vietnam conflict and then our commanders abandoned it like and very few utilize them how they're supposed to be utilized in the GWAT. Like, and yeah, I don't know why we came to this. We trained somebody their entire career to be in a two man element to 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 sit in a hide and to take precision shots at high value targets. And now we're saying, oh no, no, no we can't send two people out. That's uh, that's absurd. What was the fucking point of putting them through all the fucking school then? Good point. <laughs> yeah, and it was it was a doctrine developed based off of the fact that they want to avoid like a media catastrophe. Like nobody because like that, that would be used that. against like, us from a propaganda but, perspective. They were trying to avoid that. Like even there, like they wouldn't let us leave in elements of less than eight people. I'm like, the, well, that's our that's what we do. And, and we can look at a movie like Enemy at the Gates. What did they used? The sniper and the reporting of Zaychev, is what was his name? Yeah. Uh, they used that as a propaganda piece to instill fear into the right. enemy. Why one, didn't we do one that? One man like, that can completely disrupt <laughs> yes. a whole command structure. Like, missed. that is a and huge threat. giving the enemy fear. Yeah, because now... Look at DC. DC sniper did the same thing. Yep. Like, and I feel like, because I, I physically saw that. I saw in my battalion in 2007, our commander refused to use the entire sniper detachment, whereas the sister battalion was sending out their SKT teams in two-man elements, and they were mopping the floor with opposition. They, they had something like 60 kills in the first, like, 30 days of people that were in placing IEDs, that were messing with their camera systems. Like, so we're looking at the sister battalion's battle space and reading their updates and looking at our commander like this is working. Are we going to do it? No, no, no. I'm not sending two guys out there. They're, they're not trained for that. Well, they are. They are. You have an entire <laughs> no, that's sniper exactly detachment. What they're Every one for. of them's ranger qualified and been to the U.S. Army sniper school. That's, what more do you want? <laughs> that's education of, of commanders is what that is. That's it's why risk. there's like a mortar it's, leader. It's course risk and versus and like it's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, we don't jump. We don't jump into very few jumps anymore into anything right. we're very so we have all these these things that we've trained to and then we don't utilize them well a lot of conventional commanders have no idea how to use soft yeah that's a good point yeah i think a lot of commanders might not understand the full utility of an asset right so yeah. even with all their schools and their you know they they get opportunities we were talking about it today they get opportunities to go back and get a you know a master's degree and a bunch of other shit that they truly don't going to really help them when they get a corporate yeah. job. Uh, yeah. It's I've really going to help. Them. I've never seen a Colonel playing chess with us. This is kind of my point. It's like, we weren't, you weren't using this as a collective effort to move your pieces around your battle space yep. and, and, and essentially obtain what your objective was. Yeah. But I think that there were, I mean, I'm not trying to take, I am ch- taking a devil's advocate on this. I think there was a lot of confusion as to, 
even what their clear end state objectives were. I agree with that. And then when you can, when you have that much ambiguity as a commander of a specific, we'll call it battle space, and you don't have clear, concise directive as to what is my success criteria for this. Yeah, what does it look like? What Mm -hmm. does this look like? And then... Then you, you know, you allow the individual commanders underneath you, depending, right, to paint their own canvas. And some of these other guys underneath them, they're, I mean, we've seen it. Everybody has their, their good and their bad and their ugly, right? And we have guys, and, you know, Tyr and I have similar backgrounds. We know a lot of similar people. You have guys that really shouldn't be in charge of ODAs in war. Like, you just, they should not be in charge. But because of time and grade, they're in that fucking position. You don't want those guys going out and taking the team to do shit. You just don't want them to do that. They're not, they're going to get somebody fucked up or they're going to do something really fucked up. Right. So, and you have, uh, we've, we've had shared circumstances all the way around. You've also had company commanders and battalion commanders. Like, like the, the, the last group commander that, that I had at, at 19th group, he was a fucking full blown idiot. Like, he was a full-blown, mouth-breathing idiot. I don't need to say his name. They can take some guesses however they were. But he he should have been selling real estate somewhere. Like, he should not have been doing the job that he was doing. Like, they don't have the fucking guts for it. They don't have the guts. They, don't, they, they, they just don't have the fucking... When I say that, some of these guys just needed to take a different profession. You know, maybe like, yeah, but I mean, you know, writing copy a nut, for like a field nut, and stream. That's, that's a, a better fucking like, job for that. to look in, to look into that though, with a microscope and say that if you're going to be a green beret and a special forces unit commander, you better be the, one of the best tacticians on the fucking planet when it comes to unconventional but war. It's, that's not true. You have, you have a bunch of guys that are there for the hat. Yeah, but that's what you, that's what the, the standard should be. You're a. You're a group commander. You better be the fucking. You better have your doctorate in unconventional warfare on how to utilize this group. So back to the wars that we continue <laughs> to get away from for some reason. This isn't a command commander because I've, I've I've also worked under a fuck ton of great, like extremely intelligent, driven fucking commanders that are that have saved the lives and fucking executed plenty of motherfuckers. It's just. You know, you, the, the the bad apples tend to stick out a yeah. lot for some reason, obviously, because they're the biggest pains in all of our asses. I feel like so, we were picturing the same person or people when you said that. Well, we definitely have <laughs> one guy specifically yeah. that we're picturing. That's yeah. just a like fucking absolute so dumpster nightmare. fire so of a human being. <laughs> 1500s native war you tribe be orgy. Like, this was before horses, by the way. No, this is it before. Horses. Well, horses 1500s came. 1500s is before well, horses made it yeah, to the United States. 1600s, 1600s right? was horses yeah. when the Spanish Spanish brought them over in the 1500s. Uh-oh. And then by 1600s, 1700s. Like, no, I would have been, I would You're, have preferred the horse okay, era okay. after just, the Spanish brought them over. Yep. If it's before horse, we're really talking it's about completely like different hunter story. gatherer. Yeah, yeah, riding around on the women. Full on. So, yeah. 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 Right. Six hundred horseback post Spanish horse. Okay. Got it. Yep. Horses gotten the bow and arrow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe, like, maybe like a little bronze like age that. weaponry. Ooh, okay. I like yeah. that. I like, I like where your head's at on that one. Yeah. yeah. Way be outside the box. Way outside the Way box. Way outside the box. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, I love that about Logan. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and and I forget where 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 did you go? I'm revolutionary. You're the revolutionary. But I want a team. I want I want a crew with me. Right. Yeah. That's my that's my fantasy. Yeah. That's that conflict. Like to be a part of. Like to be a a part of the battle that fucking forged our country. Like that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, But just to be a small like kill team, like eight guys, and we just had free reign of an area that just said take out as many British as you can. That would be a dream come true. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's like really when guerrilla warfare started started for us, right? As a nation, for us. Well, that's when everything started as a nation for us. Well, yes, but <laughs> sorry, guerrilla warfare, like in its, you know, indoctrination in a sense, like when it I was like, know. that's a good. Hey, question. this is this yeah. is when we're doing this. So, you know, I'm thinking of the Patriot and yeah. and those little type of units that 
were located off the grid and then would come in, hit the British, get out of there, do it again yeah. the next day. So in Western disrupt warfare, the supply chain. did guerrilla warfare start in America? In Western warfare? Or did, when did guerrilla warfare start in I, general? I, I'm, fair, I'm fairly certain we didn't. Because what we right. were doing is we were adapting like Native American, part of the Native American fighting style yeah. into the, right. Came the from conventional the circumstance. Warfare. Yeah, yeah. They say, it says it started 1775. Hmm. So, look, I American think, Revolution. Yeah. So I think that that's 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 probably like I think you have to at least pay homage to where the where did it come from and originate. Right? Daniel Day Lewis invented it. Yeah, that's true. Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> yeah. Well, I thought of another conflict Did. that I would want nothing to do with, and that would be Sylvia Bay, the assault uh, Australia did on Turkey. That's well, yeah, def- that's definitely yeah. a no, a no for me. <laughs> I I feel like a real big pussy for saying this. Like I feel like a really, really big pussy for saying this. But the the island hopping campaigns would have been, Ugh. I think, would have been really brutal. So brutal. fucking brutal. Yeah. yeah. Now, granted the opportunity to, I, I don't think, like, just, just so we know, statistically, I do not think I would have made that. I don't think any of us would, right? I don't even think statistically. Well, you've got to think of just the enemy, the enemy you're facing now. We would does not, have not fear, Dave would have made does it. Does not fear death and fucking wants nothing more than yeah. to kill as many of us as physically possible. That is a different enemy yeah. that we've... Yeah. <laughs> When's the, la- the last Japanese soldier, what did he, he finally... Got talked like out of the hills in the 93. 80s. 93. 93. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 93. There was a dude in, Look in, it the, up. in the I Philippines think I'm right. yeah. still sniping people. Jesus. Yeah, Japanese that was soldier. on uh, Hardcore History. Yeah. It yep. would have really, like, knowing now, like, going into the Pacific, not knowing anything about it, that would have been the better circumstance, I think, to then to You'd know be in a better mindset. What is coming in the Pacific. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you're, like, going back going, oh, fuck. Oh fuck. oh fuck! Oh fuck! Like I would. Well, I remember when I was in the Marine Corps when the Pacific series came out, right? And we were, we were all so excited, like we're, you know, we're getting our version of Band of Brothers, and right. then we finished that series, and we're like, that would have fucking sucked. Like sucked. this series is so depressing because like, like one guy, like one guy yeah. made it. The best you can like, hope for is one guy you made it through the story. Chronically wet, yeah. wet your pants. That's that's the best you could. Hope well, for. this yeah. is this is why I'm really excited <laughs> like, for like about 30 more years of technology for VR because I, I'm excited for us to go and fight these conflicts in VR together when when the technology supports it. <laughs> because it'll be a yeah. blast. Space, space, space. Hey, we're going to go I, fight all our battles in space now. Right. And that'll determine victors. Like, Ender's game is... Yeah. It's going to happen yeah. eventually. I, I, I think a lot of it would be like how motivated would you be to fight an enemy, right? So I think that's part of the psychological You need a good aspect. Yeah, yeah, you need one. That's why like the British is super appealing. It's the civil easy to war, hate. It's The easy. Civil War is fucking horrible. Yeah, that like, one's it's just hard a horrible circumstance mm-hmm. all the way around. You know, fighting Nazi Germany is super easy, easy for people yeah. to rationalize. Easy and to hate the enemy. Super right. easy. You'd be very motivated. You'd be very motivated to get up every day and conduct the art of war, knowing like I'm going to get up to kill Nazis today. This is super fun. Yeah, I'm just going to stay here. Especially if you're successful at it, like that would be. You wouldn't want that war to end. That'd just be like I'm going to fucking kill Nazis all day. Okay, give me another. Give me another <laughs> fucking fun thing to do. You know, <laughs> right? I mean, that's yeah. kind of the way it boils down to. Whereas like. You know, the, the the Japanese were fucking, they hated Americans. I mean, obviously, a lot of it was like. They hated everybody that wasn't they Japanese. They hated everybody that wasn't Japanese. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Yeah, well, they established, like, jihad without uh, religious ideology. Like they It did was it. religious ideology. Yeah. The emperor was, was yeah. considered a god. <clears throat> yeah. But they did so, it with po- politics interwoven yeah. in that. Which would be super interesting because that's that's actually would be like even going back to follow Logan's train of thought to go back to the smaller wars within history that have been fought, not necessarily as Americans, but what foreign wars have taken place throughout the last several hundred years. And the reasons behind that. Interesting to be part There's of. There's a great book. Uh, what's it called? 
It's by Max Boot. I'll come to it. Sorry. Go ahead. I'm going to look it up. Because like the fall of Troy, like, it's all over a chick. You have hundreds of thousands of people moving. It becomes and less. fighting. All because the king is mad that his, fuck, that his woman ran off. Look. It becomes less about the enemy and more about taking control. That further back in history, it's about we're, we're going to own this now. This is our shit. Yeah, we're either taking land or we're taking revenge. The Savage Wars of Peace. The Savage Excellent Wars of Peace. Excellent quarantine read. The really? Savage Wars of Peace. Yep. Excellent read. Excellent read. Don't even have to be interested in the military to, to get something out of this one. And when does that take place? Or what it's, time? it's actually a cross broad, broad spectrum yeah. of, of history. Talks about Smedley Butler. Talks about the Banana Wars. Talks about the Boxer, the Bo- Boxer Rebellion. French, French Rebellion. Rebellion. French Banana Wars. Yeah, yeah the Chiquita okay. Banana Wars, actually. Yeah, Literally, the Chiquita, the Chiquita Banana Wars. Yeah, we, we, were, Chiquita we were in a conflict Wars. in Central America. Over the for Chiquita. Yeah, for <laughs> Chiquita. It's <laughs> so true. <laughs> I think the most interesting profession in warfare would have been post-1946, post-World War II, working for when the CIA was established in 1950, but really it was around in the 40s, even mm-hmm. it was just a different name. Just the onset of the Cold War. But from 19, essentially 1950 yeah, you've to said the Frank before. Church hearings, yeah. and that was like 77 or something like that. So you got 20 years of just... 20 years... No oversight. Of suitcases of cash. fucking money. It's, it's still just okay to assassinate Taking people. it to the fucking task <laughs> of the Soviets every day. Yeah. It would not... It would not have been hard for me to motivate myself for that yeah. every day. Like, I'm super passionate. Like, I'm basically yeah. an artist at this point. My, my yeah. art is my profession. I love killing Russians. Fuck yeah, this is great. Yeah. What do you I want? don't think I would have ever left that job. Yeah. What do you want me to do? Further the interests of the United States. Okay. What's my left what's and right region? lateral limit? <laughs> Further the interests of the United States. Okay. okay. Got it. Yeah. Got, Got it. it. Tracking. Thumbs up. <laughs> hey, we now control Costa Rica. Hey, good job down there. Good job. <laughs> what was just mortared a city for no reason? Well, they we blamed it on the Russians. <laughs> 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 oh, and also I'm the king down yeah. there. <laughs> I think my yeah. uh, my my war that I would not want to be in. It's a it's a tough call again, but I think I'm going to go with Korea. Yeah, Korea would have been Ooh, fucking horrible, nasty, Nor horrible. horrible. Well, I just yeah. I, I never want to fight in the cold. Like man, I think about I, that I element that on top of everything I've ever else been in my life. I was in an exercise over there in in 2012, one of the annual war fighting exercises right. they do. I woke up, we hit, we infilled and then walked, we, in, we helo infilled at night, overland, and then walked up through boulders to get up on the top of this mountain, which the, the English translation of the name of this mountain was literally Windy Mountain. Great, great spot, <laughs> great spot for a, for a G base. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then it proceeded to piss rain on us for the next three nights. We're in poncho hooches. And I remember waking up at like three in the morning. Because all that, that pelting on my poncho had stopped. I'm like, oh, finally. And when I, when I got up a couple hours later, snow, snow. I'm, I pulled down my bivy sack and my poncho was just like a centimeter from my nose. The precipitation had not stopped. It had just gotten colder. And now yeah. I had an inch of frozen water in my poncho covered with six inches of snow. Oh, fuck yeah. And so that's how we stayed for the, for the next, you know, six, seven days. That was... It was not enjoyable. And I just remember thinking, man, I've got Gore-Tex. I've got all these layers, all these synthetic layers, everything else. I've got better equipment right now than, than even the conventional has. guys have. Right. In the- and I, I'm still sucking. Yeah. I, like, I had to preheat my jet boil in my bag. Oh, yeah. So that it would spark. So the fuel. It was, it was, that, it was that cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just thinking, man, there were dudes that did this with actual kinetic warfare up and down these mountains wearing... Shitty boots and wool coats. Yeah. Leather, yeah, leather boots. And, oh, by the way, you're hearing a whistle and being told to fix bayonets. Yeah. So combine the suck now that right. you just described, but now you're fixing bayonets in the dark. <laughs> How many Medal of Honor citations have these words in there? 
having expended all his ammo, yeah. PFC blank, <laughs> yeah. fixed his E tool. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. no, nah, nah, no, nah. A nah, bayonet, yeah. Charging, <laughs> like hearing a whistle and, a, and having a lieutenant, like, like initiating the charge with fixed bayonets, that's the point where I'm going to be like, Fuck this. What scares me sucks. more about what you just said is having a lieutenant lead. And that's, like, <laughs> that's actually where I was. You scared the shit out of me, where I was like, whoa, I, I'm not actually. I've never seen that. I, I've never. I don't know what that feels like. Oh, man. I'm super glad. I don't know what that feels <laughs> that's like. A good point. We don't right? have lieutenants in special. No. But also, huh? but also, too, the psychology is so different when you think about the numbers like imagine going back with a tenth of your entire company look now now your whole your whole neighborhood is gone right like everybody you know there's there's almost a full battalion wiped out in vietnam like like that's a lot of families that's a like lot. and yeah you're you're one of 60 guys left over from an entire battalion everybody you knew got killed you're kind of just like don't get a unit tattoo. You're gonna have to reconsolidate, get a new one. Yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> yeah, just to exit out. <laughs> so that's just like <laughs> like like that's there. wild to think about. Like I mean, because in our time frame, we were we were dealing with you know high times, maybe one every couple weeks, one a week. In the yeah. SOCOM community, like yeah, I mean, I don't know, Logan, you guys kind of went through a burst. lot. Was it one a week for you guys? Two a week? Well, we started with about five per week for the first you were bit. you were you in the in the invasion or no in i'm like, saying it what what year what years are we talking about uh 10 10 and okay. a 10 beginning 11 it tapered off towards yeah. the end because you know we yeah, but started now, like, figuring stuff yeah, out i'm but. saying like you you roll out with 90 guys in a platoon and you come back with eight like whoa yeah that was that that's was a pretty different pretty that's common a different in vietnam fucking, like yeah. I just read... Uh, oh, Alpha Company? They don't exist anymore. What do you mean they don't exist? Oh, they got wiped gone. out. What? Yeah, Alpha Company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A minus. Yeah. I just read uh, Surprise Kill Vanish, which... Oh, yeah. Gets, uh, oh, yeah. It's really good. You, you got to... I don't think you can believe everything in it. Um, well, no, but, just the opening story is total bullshit. Yeah. But it which does get into the... It. What book is this? Surprise Kill Vanish. She's talking about, like, the she knew some person from special activities division and they came in and opened up a, a, a Pelican case and he took out a knife and said, this is when things get close. Like, Fuck off. Nobody fucking says that. Fuck off. Nobody says that. And if they do, you know what they do? They're, they're a fucking gate guard. Yep. Yeah. That, they're, they're, they are a fucking <laughs> that, that gate guard. Krav Maga. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> my crap. Yeah, you know, my, my all Israeli you Krav Maga guys out there, the ones that are going, this is in case we have to go blades. <laughs> yeah, it's like, fuck off. You don't fucking I know carry at least blades. nine knives at me at all times. What? Yeah. I've, got, I've got two karambits in my lumbar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. I've got karambits. So dumb. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you, you go suppressed in subsonic when, fuck, fuck off. It doesn't, like, blades, come on. That's just stupid. Yeah, but, but anyway, she does yeah. have some. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's an over the the basic premise here is a history of clandestine warfare, and it, you know, a big section of this is on Vietnam and and some of those stories in there with Mac V. Sager, right. fucking incredible man. Like Billy like, Waugh is a legit dude. Oh yeah, and she inv- she yeah. she interviewed the shit out of him. She later, I think she later admitted that first, and it was so funny because when she was on Rogan's show. I was listening to that opening story that she was telling, and I was like, I was yelling at the, ra- I was yelling at the <laughs> yeah. podcast. I was like, "You're full of shit! You're full of shit!" I was like, totally yelling at it, and or or, or whoever you were talking to at the time is full of shit. They're 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 a KBR, fucking yeah, like. Because they can't toilet explain, cleaner. They can't they're explain a fucking it. toilet like, cleaner. Yeah, they can't mm-hmm. They're sucking it. shit up into a truck. That's what they're doing. <laughs> you're, you're dumb as fuck, lady, because nobody says that. One of my mentors uh, that was my first squadron supervisor, uh, Buddy MacArthur, he was on a mission with Billy Wall in the invasion of Afghanistan. Wow. And said that you had a 75 year old yeah. man driving a fucking. A, 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 a Hilux. Yeah. 
He said, like a fucking madman up a hill, and he watched Billy get out of the fucking truck and chase these Taliban dudes down. That's amazing. With a Shorty M4 gunning them uphill, like while they're all like scrambling, like, what the fuck is this <laughs> old guy doing? He's running yeah. uphill gunning down Taliban dudes right. with a Shorty 70 M4 at 75 five. years old. That and, is like, incredible. Buddy says he gets back and she's like, Jesus Christ. He's like, you ready? We could keep going, man. <laughs> like, That's amazing, dude. He's got a good that, death, too. That yeah, has really to, like, well. and, and like knowing mm-hmm. knowing who Billy Wall is since I was young in the military, it's like, that's like Buddy's story of that. Like you got to go on one of his last missions when he was working for the agency at that time. Like he came and spoke like, when we were when <laughs> when I was at the Q course. He came and spoke to Phase One. Mm. So, super interesting. Yeah, like he came and spoke, and it was like, and it, it it I remember the briefing or one of the briefings he gave because he was like the most dangerous man in the world right now is a guy named Osama bin Laden. That was a. Uh, 99 <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. wild yeah 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 because yeah, it was it was so interesting because i remember that so well and then, yeah uh, it gets into the book on that like he was i believe it was uh oh, what kind of, i can't remember but he was tracking him like 95 96 yeah, well, was, yeah. i yeah. thought it was right after he went after the jackal he had then he then he had shifted his well, he knew exactly where he was they, yeah they knew he had they, two he opportunities had to yeah. to kill him and he got turned down both times mm-hmm. Yeah, the Clinton administration said no. Wow. Yeah, they turned him down. Yeah, we'll just do a tomahawk. Yeah, they were like, we'll just throw a missile up there. You know, it's okay. <laughs> they had the opportunity to fucking well, that's save. Like, like, save. Us like think about hunting that. The jackal. Think that's about the book that. Yeah. yeah, hunting yeah. the jackal was yeah. Billy's book. Great read. Think about that. Think about nobody says Bill Clinton is a fucking idiot because he didn't take the shot on. Yeah, I know that's been that's, that's crazy. Nobody says that. Nobody, Nobody's like, nobody hey, holds think that about how many people and lives we would have saved if the fucking president would have grabbed his nuts for the right reason versus the wrong and reason. Taking somebody yeah. out before. And take, Not and once, taking, but twice. Yeah, twice. Nobody's like, you, you don't hear the criticism of Clinton, how he got his fucking dick sucked in the lo, in the in the Oval Office. Now he didn't kill Bin Laden. You got all these fucking hardcore Democrats that are all like, oh my god, Bill Clinton, the Clinton era, and it's like they're. What? That guy was a piece of shit. How do you not think that he's a piece of shit in this <laughs> Me Too movement, which is totally a digression from where we are? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Oh, my God. I just fucking went off on Bill Clinton for a second. I can't even think about I'm the dizzy. I'm dizzy. I, I can't even think about no, the Clinton area. It's so we, shitty. You know, it's like, such a I, shitty time. I told, you, I told you the other day that I had rewatched Band of Brothers because I wanted to. I hadn't seen it since it came out. But... Hearing those interviews in the beginning, it made me like I reached out to Gary O'Neill again again because he only lives an hour and a half away. And it's like, I want to get this guy in front of a camera and tell your fucking stories because they're so fucking wild. People have no clue. Some of this shit went down when Mac V was humming at its fucking peak point. Like and also too, guys like Billy Wall, like I think you your personal fucking dream would be like somebody handing you a folder and saying, hey, the jackal, go find him and kill him. You'd be like. Not anymore. You wouldn't like, but that? a few days. I mean, a few years ago. Yeah, yeah that I would, mean, my <laughs> personal dream now is, you know, way way different than, yeah. than I was but, when I was in but, my thirties. Yes, if you were just handed a file, you said you have here's your budget. You have to kill this. Yeah, person. if somebody, that's if somebody, a really if cool somebody handed mission. me that, yeah. if somebody handed me that file today, and they're like, here's the infinite amount of money, and we want you to go kill that guy, I'd be like, um, can I have? How, 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 fuck how, off. Here you can. My biggest. You wouldn't take that as a weekend project. Fuck no. I. I, I, I'm like. (laughs) I I, I don't spend enough time with my kids as it is. I'd be like, Are you serious? Like, what are you, some fucking weirdo bureaucrat from the fucking wingnut three letter agency? It's like go go play golf with some other fucking douchebag in in Washington D.C. and find some other fucking chump to do your dirty work. I'm gonna go to Guatemala with my buddies and we're gonna have a fucking great time. Like, Wear some go find shorts. some shithead to go do your fucking work for you. I, I actually have a business to run, a family I care about. That would be my answer. Now, hey, now, have you read Hunting the Jackal? Yeah, yeah. Have, have you read it? I haven't. It, yeah. it gets it's into it quite a bit in that book. Black Hawk Down, right? Mark Bowden? No, it's uh, it's Billy Wasp. Billy, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. It is. It is definitely written from his perspective. It is really? definitely, yeah, first person. Yeah. That. So my biggest takeaway from that book was not all the crazy adventures he had. It was holy shit. Again, the autonomy. Yeah, like the they autonomy. just handed him a mission, and he just went and did it, did and he it. got it done. 
On his However, own. <laughs> yeah, I am so used, I'm so just trained on bureaucracy and process that that is what really amazed me. I was like, wow. Wow. To work you, in an environment you could just, like that. They just, okay, that didn't work. So he went and scaled this building and had glass on this yeah. dude in another country. And nobody gave him permission nobody. to do that. He went and did it because that was meeting the intent of the mission. <laughs> there, there's, <laughs> there's another guy, the guy that uh, tracked and killed Che. Yeah. Um, forget his name, but the guy that tracked and killed Che, he worked at the agency forever. Fucking yeah, he kid. was part of... Uh, he was part of the Bay of Pigs. Bay of Pigs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He tracks his entire lineage all the way back to... Yeah. Like the, you know, that was, what, 59? So super interesting. A couple of those guys, they just did work. Right. And like whether they were on the books of another company or on the agency, it just kind of went around. It was always nebulous and mm-hmm. super interesting the way that thing used to work. Like, you don't I'm not worry saying about command it. and control is bad. It's just, you know, the con out processes and... Everything oh no! It's and, all we've ruined it. What 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 level we've, con op is yes, this? Yes, we've Who's we've completely this, ruined blah, blah. it. Like, well, yeah, because you have people that make rank based on what type of process they put in, right? Which you, you'll hear the crack to, uh, which is interesting because Felix Rodriguez, Felix Rodriguez, yeah. So as we're talking about Vietnam, we have this new RTD or ready to drink. You just probably just heard this. Ready Tell me about it. Mm. Crack. And this has tiger stripe camo on it, and it was an homage to Mac V. Sog. Come to find out, a little interesting piece of military history that's directly correlated to the ready to drink, which this is the espresso mocha. Uh, Mac V actually, they, they didn't wear tiger stripes. Uh, very, very, very few guys actually wore the tiger stripes. Mm. Um, yeah, I believe they it's the, just like infantry the scouts, like the one seventy. Yeah, I and mean, they would they would paint them. Like they would like had tiger stripes. They would paint them depending, but they were those were essentially their their garrison uniforms. But they no, didn't, okay. they didn't wear them very often in the field. That's funny, uh, which I thought was super interesting. And uh, and then the other guys, like the the more the support guys, they would wear tiger stripes for the most part. But it's kind of funny how they would. They're like tiger stripes. Yeah, I mean it's part of Mac V, but we didn't wear them all that often. <laughs> well, it was it was the but uniform of the South Viet- Vietnamese, right? Or some of them, some. and then some. I don't Sock know that, the recent when photos they were working with them. The surface of the Green Berets wearing those tiger stripes with their patches and stuff that looked cool as shit. <laughs> It, yeah, they looked great, but that yeah, was like great. for their photo ops. Yeah, <laughs> look good. But you can also get this RTD on our RTD subscription. So yeah, it's do, in Can Club. Don't now. wait for can your Club. coffee. Don't wait for your coffee. Get the RTD on your subscription. Uh, we we do a slight percentage off if you're getting it on there. Subscribe and save. Free the shipping. thing that you really want to join, both if you really are Black Rifle Coffee aficionado, the one thing you want to join is the specialty. When we say specialty coffees, the ECS, the exclusive, exclusive. coffee subscription. Uh, those are the fucking, those are the best coffees we got as far as cross the board. Because when I say it's the best coffees we have, uh, it, we spend a lot of time still curating everything from tip to toe with the ECS, the designs, the profiles. They change every month. Uh, it, it, it's my favorite side of the company right now. That's where I spend a lot of time. Um, and then on the side of this RTD, as we go back into this, the military veterans at Black Rifle Coffee Company have developed this kick-ass espresso mocha that is a blend of espresso milk, cocoa protein, caffeine to help you dominate your day. Um, I really had a hard time with this copy. I had a really hard time with this writing because I was like, I just wanted to put in there uh, espresso mocha. That was it. And then the 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 people that were helping me develop it, you yeah. know, like, no, you have to put some type of cool product description on there. And I was yeah. like, all right, well, I've read the. I went back and forth. It was editors. fucking horrible. <laughs> yeah, it was a horrible process, but it's a great drink. It is it really very is good, amazing drink. So back to what you were saying. Sorry. What was I saying? What were you saying? 
What was he saying, Dave? Do you I don't know. That? I'll take this little gap to do a little plug for uh, the Black Rifle Hiring Initiative. That Ooh, was yeah, that's good I like that. Uh, I like that, that a lot. I've always thought they wanted a career yeah. with Black Rifle. Yeah. Do you want to work here? Do you want to work at Black Rifle? Well, we're hiring. We're going to be putting probably close to 40 positions on the website already. What? 40? But probably. say, how are you hiring this many people right now, Logan? I mean, with COVID-19 and everybody... You're over worrying here about this? How are you people? hiring so many people? I, I don't know. Why don't we let the CEO handle that? Oh, that's right. I guess that is me. Well, we have been very fortunate here at the company of Black Rifle Coffee is a combination of things. You know, the subscribers, the people that listen to the, the, the podcast and the subscribers to the coffee club, they've made sure that we've been able to continue hiring in such a, a horrific time for the United States. So we got to do our part here as far as the company is concerned for taking care of the community. We're taking care of our, our company and the employees, and we're expanding our hiring initiatives. So if you want to work at Black Rifle Coffee, there is no better time to apply because we have a ton of openings. And now is the time for you maybe you got to dust off some of your editing skills. Maybe you're a camera guy and you're in a management position back in the day. Now's the time. You want to market Hell for us? Yeah. You want to be in content? You want to be in media? You want to be in HR? Get over. Get to Black Rifle Coffee. What is it? Forward slash? Careers. Careers. Throw your resume in the hat. Like, join the team. Because it's a pretty pretty fun place to work. Would you agree, Logan? Uh, yeah, I would, I would say so. How yeah, many we, presents do you think I'd buy you on a regular annual cycle? I... I've tracked it. It's about yeah. one a quarter. It's about one a quarter. Yeah, yeah give or take. It's about one <laughs> a quarter. You know, how many presents do I buy you, Jared? Do you count the questionable foods that you that you put in front of me as well as presents? Yeah. So I do. <laughs> okay. Either way, it's two, three. This is a super fun place to work. Random meats. Yeah, random eats. <laughs> it's actually the website where I get the food for Jared is called questionablefoods.com. <laughs> they deliver. Go ahead and register that, Dave. They, right <laughs> they yes, deliver. First. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell you when, and they don't tell you how. So last time Jared got a delivery. Three weeks of E. coli it, I followed. <laughs> it was at 3 o'clock in the morning from <laughs> what appears to be an obese garbage man. <laughs> <laughs> well, feeding him in bed while he was half asleep. <laughs> it's called questionablefoods.com. I just, I just want to put out there that I don't put metrics on, on your gifts, and I just cherish your friendship. Yeah, I know. This says someone who don't get no gifts. Yeah. 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 Don't get Look no that. gifs. He's trying to kiss. He tried he's to trying steal to, my belt. He's trying to kiss He some tried to steal right my belt. So I didn't some, steal your belt. He's trying to, I gave he's it to, to my girlfriend who just happens to... Uh, also have the same waist as, as I do. <laughs> <laughs> Super fucking. <weird. laughs> she said that we could be clothes buddies. She's like four or six. <laughs> it's questionable whether just or not she's a midget. Tiny or boots. A midget. <laughs> I have, tiny I have boots. hit her up to see if she can get like a handicap <laughs> permit. Seriously. Yeah. How many stools do you have around that house? You're just the only person I've ever one that lives in the middle of a shoe. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been a great episode of Free Range American. Thanks a lot, Logan, Jared, Tear. I'm Evan. See you guys next week.